Hey everyone, welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Minolta X370. In the first video, we talked about what everything on the camera is. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to do everything that the camera can do. Now, this is an electronic camera, so we can't do anything at all without having good batteries in. So to change the batteries, just grab a coin and just unscrew the battery cap on the bottom of the camera like this until it's ready to come out and then just remove it. And you can see in there, I have two batteries. Uh, generally speaking, what I will tell you is do not use the off-brand batteries like this. Uh, I should not be using these in here. I recommend using name brand batteries, Duracell, Energizer, Sanyo, Panasonic, things like that. The, off, the ones that have no maker on them like this one, uh, those have a tendency to leak and blow up rather quickly. And so they can be really bad. What this camera uses are two 357 type. Those are also called 303, LR44, A76, S76, AG13. I think that's all of the, all of the names for them. There is a handy guide inside of the battery cap that shows you how to put the two batteries inside just like that. This is what a clean battery cap should look like. And to mount the batteries, we simply slide them both in like that. This is what a clean battery chamber should look like. So if your battery cap or chamber has white or green crystallized stuff inside of it, you're gonna to need to clean it with distilled white vinegar and a handful of cotton swabs, then some rubbing alcohol and on some cotton swabs. So uh, to load your batteries, really simple. You've got them into the holder, just drop them into the camera like this, and then you're gonna grab your coin and start threading. Now, this should thread super easily. The threads on the cap should go into the raceways and the camera, no issue. Uh, if they give you any resistance, back out and start over. And there we go. Just like that, It's we've changed batteries. It's that simple. Okay, now we've got batteries in the camera. Let's talk about how to load or how to change lenses on this. And we'll talk a little bit about lens use as well, or types of lenses, lens compatibility. To remove a lens, push down on the lens release button right here and turn counter or anti-clockwise until the red dot's at the top. And then you can simply remove the lens just like that, okay? Mounting a lens, it's exactly the opposite process. You simply take the lens, put the red dot on the lens to the red dot on the flange index, and then turn it clockwise until it clicks and you've mounted your lens. If your lens doesn't move around, you've done your job correctly. Now I'm gonna show you something on this lens right here. If you notice, this lens next to the, tw the 22 on it is green. On some lenses, I think the 16 might be green. It depends on the smallest aperture opening. If you push this, but this little button, oops, if you set the 22 there to align with the, the aperture index, you can now push this button downward and you've got a little green mark right there. This does nothing whatsoever with the X370 except screw up your photos. This is only for the X700. So what this is, is this is a program mode selector. The X700 has program mode, the X370 does not. If your lens is set up where you can see this, your photos are all going to turn out badly. Uh, I believe it will be that they will be way dark. Your camera will not meter properly and everything will be shot at F22. So with this, camera. If you have an MD variant of the SR mount, just make sure that that green index is hidden and that you're using your aperture ring for all of your aperture settings. Okay. Another thing about this is that um, lenses of this era were often called MD mount lenses, which is not actually their name. They were, Minolta used the SR mount. Any SR mount lens going back to the 1960s with like the SRT 101 will work on this camera properly as it's and fully you can get aperture priority mode with those old 1960s lenses. So if you're looking for a lens for this camera, you're going to look for an SR mount lens, but often because people call these MD mount, you can also search for MD and MC mount lenses for Minolta, and that will give you options as well. The Minolta Alpha mount or AF mount lenses will not mount on this camera. So SR is what you're looking for. All right, so we've got batteries, we've got a lens. We need to put film in this to go take photos. 
So with this camera, even if you're before frame one with it, if you're in auto mode, it could give you very long photos when you're loading film and that if you have your lens cap on could be uh, boring to wait for the photos to be finished. So one real quick thing you can do is set this to one one thousandth of a second when you load your, your film and it'll be a slightly faster experience. I'm gonna open up the cap back of the camera, I'm gonna grab our roll of 35 millimeter film and just drop it in here, push the post down into place, pull out a leader. We're going to feed the leader into the take up spool over here. And then I'm going to put my index finger gently over the sprocket holes and the sprocket opening right here as I trigger the shutter and just let the film roll under my finger. And that will help ensure that it gets taken up smoothly on the take up spool. And at this point, I'm gonna close the back of the camera and advance to frame one. So after we've gotten to frame one, you need to make sure you set your ISO. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna push this button here on the back down and we're gonna rotate this dial until we get to, what did we load, 400 ISO film, until that 400 is right over that index. So just make sure to double check that your film speed is set and that you, uh, now you're ready to go and take photos. Now, we're gonna go through the, our day taking photos and I want you to notice here that as I'm advancing the film, this film rewind knob is spinning. And this is spinning because the film is being pulled through the camera, being pulled out of the cassette, and the cassette that it's attached to, the forks on this film rewind knob are plugged into it. This is why we know that rewinding the film will work, and we're gonna see that in just a second. One important thing about film is that it is one and done. So it can record light a single time in a Focused, uh, focused set of light with the proper amount of proper amount of light for the film speed with the proper shutter speed and exposure uh, aperture rather to record an image, or it can record all of the photons that hit it in an uncontrolled manner like this. If you were to open your film camera with the film like this, all of the film outside of the cassette would be erased. Any photo that was on it or that could be taken on it would be gone. You could not use it anymore because it would absorb all of the photons that reach it until it reached the most photons it could absorb. And at that point, it would not be able to record an image. So uh, we have here the film. And as I take a photo, I want you to see what happens to the film inside of the camera. I take a photo. Here's where the photo area is. I advance the film and the film moves from where it was being exposed to a slightly further area down here on the take-up spool. Okay, so that's great, but what about when we're done with the roll? Push down the film rewind button, and I'm gonna hold my finger here because the, the film spring normally does this job, but the film backs open, and I'm just gonna start rewinding the film. And you can see that the film that was, all the photos were taken on it, and now we're going to rewind it into the cassette. At the end of the roll, then all you have to do is rewind this the entire way so that there's no leader. We're gonna pretend I've done that. And uh, there's no leader here. At this point, once you have finished rewind, rewinding the film fully, now you can open up your camera, lift up this post, drop the film into your hand, just like that, so smoothly. It looks like I practice. And um, when, once you're once your film is, is rewound into the cassette, then you put it in your pocket and you can either grab your next roll of film to keep taking photos, or if you're done for the day, close the film back, trigger your shutter, turn off your camera, and you're good to go. So let's talk a little bit about flash use with the Minolta X370. To use your flash, the first thing we need to know is that you're gonna be doing it in manual, exposure, manual shutter speed mode, okay? You don't want to do this in automatic, because you won't have control over whether or not the flash timing is correct and the camera has no idea whether or not the flash is on it and ready to go, okay? This does not have a hot shoe that can communicate that back to the camera. So 1 60th of a second is the fastest shutter speed at which you can use a flash. You could also use it at 1 second, 1, one eighth, any of these from 1 60th to 1 second you could use a flash could also use it in bulb, okay? So all of those work. Anything faster than 1 60th, 1 1 25th, 1 1 thousandth, you can't use a flash and have the image fully illuminated. Well, why is that? 
So the way that the flash works is that it more importantly has to do with the way that the, the curtains work. When you're ready to take a photo, your curtains here, it's closed in front of the image. When you take your photo at 1 60th of a second, the first curtain opens, and when it finishes its travel, the entire frame is exposed to light and the flash fires, and then 1 60th of a second elapses, and then the second curtain closes, and then when you advance the film, they reset like that. Okay, so what happens at 1 15th of a second? Well, the exact same thing. The first curtain opens, the flash fires when it reaches the end of its travel. 1 15th of a second of time elapses, and then the second curtain closes, and they go like this. The curtains don't move faster or slower. They always move at the exact same speed, regardless of your shutter speed setting. All right, well, what about one one thousandth of a second? Your first curtain opens, and then your second curtain follows right behind it, just like this. So at no point is your entire film open to uh, entirely open to light. There's a slit that means that as this slit travels, that film behind it only receives light for one one thousandth of a second first curtain finishes travel, the flash will fire, and you'll have this strip of illuminated light and a very dark image, a very dark image over here. And what this will tell you is how wide the curtain is when it's set to one one thousandth of a second, how wide that gap is. So that's the mechanics of why you can only use a 60th of a second and slower for your flash shutter speeds. So let's talk about how to actually use a flash just a little bit. So this camera can use any flash that has a single contact on the bottom of it. And with flashes like that, they'll, they'll all have different layouts. They'll have manual controls on the back. And you'll be dialing in your settings on the back of the camera based on the guide number, your aperture, your film speed, and your subject distance. All of that's beyond the scope of this video, but it is important to note, note how guide numbers work if you're going to be doing flash with this camera because you will have to understand that and dial in your settings manually. With the flash on this camera, you can only put it onto the hot shoe right up here. And the worst possible place to have a flash on a camera is right there on top of the hot shoe pointing at your subject. The reason is because the light will leave the flash in like this flat wall, reach your subject, bounce back to your lens, and two things are going to happen. The first is that it's going to make your subjects look flat and waxy at, no matter what kind of film you're using. With color film, it's going to make your subject's eyes glow red. Okay, so this is, this is a no-no. There are a couple of things you can do because you are limited to using the hot shoe on this camera to improve flash use. The first one is to, to think about the way that we see the world all the time. If we're outside during the day, the sun is above us. If we're outside at night, street lights or the moon are above us. If we're indoors at work or school or wherever, the ceiling lights are above us. So we are always seeing other things and people being lit from above not any other orientation. So you want to mimic that with your flash to set your subjects up to have the most flattering lighting possible from a flash which is inherently unflattering lighting. To do that, some flashes like this one allow you to tilt the flash upward. So if you imagine that this was mounted on the camera right now and you had a white ceiling above you, you could bounce the flash upward, upward or upward and forward a little bit to have that light bounce off the ceiling and replicate natural lighting. Some flashes also the head can articulate. So if you're next to a white wall outside, you can point the flash at the wall or at the wall and slightly up, and then that will allow you to have that light bounce off the wall and back to your subject, which is a pretty good approximation of overhead lighting and can work really well for flattering lighting. So with this camera specifically, because you are locked into mounting a flash on the hot shoe, the best advice I have for you is if you're on a budget, at least get a flash that has an articulating head. If you have a few more bucks to spend, get one that can, that can tilt and swivel, and you'll have a much better time of creating lighting for your flash photos that looks good for your subjects. All right, next up, what we're gonna do is take a look at this mock-up here. And uh, this is one of the graphics straight out of the book, and I, I looked through the viewfinder and just kind of redrew it so that 
we could see what's going on inside of the viewfinder. So here's the focusing screen. When you look through your, if you look through your viewfinder right now, you're going to see something that looks kind of like this, but this will be dark with some illuminated numbers or visible numbers at any rate. Here's your focusing screen. All of this stuff out here is like just a ground matte screen, which light will focus on. This is called a microprism collar, and what this has is a bunch of little triangular microprisms. And when something is out of focus in this collar, it's going to look like it's pixelated into triangles. And then here we have a split prism. And the way that the split prism works is let's say you're taking a picture of a building, okay? And as you're focusing, the edges of the building are in this prism right here, they're separate. And in that edge of that building, it's going to be kind of blurry above and be below right here and it's going to look like a bunch of pixels in this micro prism okay as you focus that edge of that building is going to become a straight line right here it's going to be a straight line in the micro prism like this and it's going to be a straight line on the on the ground glass as well so you have three different ways of focusing here you can use the micro prism to get a specific focus point. You have the ground, the, I'm sorry, you have the split prism here to get a specific focus point. You have the micro prism to verify that focus. And you have the ground glass, ground, uh, ground matte screen area here to get a, a visualization of how sharp the area of the, the, the subject in the photo is going to be. You can use all of these in different ways for focusing. If you just want to compose your photo with something of interest over here, right? what you can do is just use the ground glass, the matte area, to get this subject in focus, and your subject will be in focus as long as you have good eyes. right? The split prism is mainly meant for people who are starting to have slightly older eyes and who need a crisper uh, way of getting things in focus. One weakness with this is that if you don't have a vertical line, if you only have horizontal lines, that's not going to do you any good at all. Okay, So um, you cannot, for instance, use the micro prism to get this windowsill with a, a freshly baked apple pie that's steaming into focus because that windowsill is going to be right there and you aren't going to be able to use it as an example okay so so these are this is how your focusing screen can work uh, and it's by and large it's a pretty good one let's talk a little bit about the light meter over here here is the light meter with all all possible things illuminated now the numbers will be illuminated because they're just uh, marked out of this black mask that's over the, the focusing screen here but these LEDs, and the M and the A are LEDs as well, will only be illuminated in different circumstances. So the M indicates you're in manual mode. The A indicates you're in auto mode. So if you are set to a manual shutter speed, the M will be illuminated. If you are set to an automatic shutter speed, which specifically is auto, then the A will be illuminated. Next to each of your shutter speeds is an LED, okay? In automatic mode, if the A is illuminated and the light next to the 125 is lit up, that means your camera is going to use 1 1 25th of a second for your selected aperture, film speed, and available lighting. Okay? If you're in automatic mode and the 250 and 1 1 25 are both lit up, that means your camera is going to pick a shutter speed somewhere between those two based on your available lighting, film speed, and uh, aperture. That's right. The X370 is not limited to these specific shutter speeds in auto mode like you are with manual mode. It can split the difference and pick whatever shutter speed it needs. So in automatic mode, let's assume you are at F17 and you have 800 ISO film and you're in full sun. You're probably going to see 1 1000th lit up and this triangle right here. That triangle means that actually the shutter speed you need is way, way, way faster than 1 1,000th of a second, and this camera can't do it. So you need to have a smaller aperture in order to get a proper exposure. All right, so let's, let's talk about the opposite down here with the triangle. In automatic mode, the triangle will be illuminated if the one is also illuminated and there's not enough light. So let's say, for instance, you're at a concert and it's dark in the concert and you're at f22 and you have 50 ISO film that triangle is going to be lit up. There's not enough light for your film and your aperture. Actually, in that setting, there's not going to be enough light with any aperture. Um, at any rate, what the triangle 
blinking triangle tells you in automatic mode is that there is not enough light for your settings so you need to open up your aperture more to get one of these one or two of these leds lit and get a, a proper exposure and also again the opposite up here too much light if this one's blinking okay down here in bulb mode when you're in bulb mode you'll have a little led i drew it in as a circle i think it might actually be an asterisk six one way half dozen the other for the purposes of this demonstration in bulb mode you have a little reminder okay so let's talk about manual shooting in manual mode you're going to have two lights lit up over here one will be flashing and one will be solid so let's say you're at f28 whatever it doesn't matter and 400 iso film and you're looking at the scene that you're going to take a photo of and you see a blinking light next to 1 1 25th and a solid light next to 1 500th that blinking light is telling you what you are set at let me make sure i got that right that blinking light will tell you what your shutter speed is set to the solid light will tell you what it needs to be so in that setting blinking 120 1 125th solid 500 you're set to 1 1 25th of a second you need 1 500th if you take that photo you're going to have a, a, an image that is two stops too bright very very bright so you can correct that by either switching up to 1 500th of a second or adjusting your aperture from f 28 up to f 56 for the same effect in terms of cutting light and uh, you will get your 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 light you, you will only have one light visible in the viewfinder which means you have a proper exposure so with manual mode the way to get a proper exposure is to adjust your settings so that you only have one light doing anything in your viewfinder and that will tell you that you have a proper exposure all right quiz time so i have six different scenarios we're going to go over with the viewfinder and we're going to figure out what each of them are telling you so here's the actual viewfinder i have it enlarged for easy reading as well right here and uh, the first one we have is we have m an illuminated m and a single light doing something next to the 1 1 25th and this is exactly the same thing that we just talked about in the last scenario looking at the larger screen what this is telling us is that we're in manual mode and we have 1 1 25th of a second as our shutter speed and that for our light film and aperture because only one light is lit up we don't have something blinking telling us it should be something different we know that we now have a proper exposure for this setting on to the next one we have the a lit up and a light next to the 500 okay this is telling us we're in automatic mode because the a is lit up and this is telling us that for our light at film speed and aperture setting the camera is going to be able to deliver us a proper exposure at 1 500th of a second so pretty straightforward we're going to come down here it's going to get a bit more complicated we're back in automatic mode and we have two lights next to the 250th and the 500th and as we talked about in the previous larger version what this is telling us is we're in automatic mode and the shutter speed will be somewhere between those two we don't know what it could be it could be 1 257th could be 1 433rd we don't know it'll be between those two here we're going to stick in automatic mode for example number four and we have a light next to the 1000 and a flashing triangle up here what this is telling us is we have way too bright a scene for the film speed and aperture that we're using the, the camera cannot deliver a shutter speed faster than 1 1000th and a proper exposure would demand that so to correct this the thing to do is to adjust the aperture to a smaller opening which would be a higher number f16 is a smaller opening than is f17 so if you're at f17 and 1 1000th of a second just start closing down until this triangle goes away and the light is between one or two of the, the other numbers it looks either like this or like this and you're going to have a proper exposure we're going to come down here to the bottom in manual mode and we know we're in manual because it says m and we have a light next to the one and a flashing down triangle we talked about this exact scenario i actually didn't mean to do this <laughs> I did not we talked about this exact scenario in the last on the last page where you have way too little light the the down triangle is telling you you have too little light you're at one one second you cannot go any slower um, but you still have too little light with your aperture and film speed you could get this triangle let's pretend for a second that 
this guy right here is not illuminated, but the, the 500 is illuminated. Okay, let's pretend right there that it is. And you still have your triangle illuminated. You could fix that by just adjusting down to, let's say, 1 60th as an example. And then when this is lit up, that triangle might go away, and that should indicate that you have enough light. Um, you could also fix that with your aperture. So there are two ways to correct this situation. The last sample is pretty straightforward. It's you're in manual mode and the, the dot is lit up next to the B. What this is just telling you is that you're in bulb shooting. Bulb is a manual exposure mode and you're gonna, you're gonna push the shutter button down, the shutter curtain will open, and when you release that shutter button, the shutter curtain will close. That's what that tells you. All right, so I promised in the first video that we talk about how to use this switch. This is the auto exposure lock. Uh, it's only going to work in auto mode. So if, you, so if you're in auto mode, then if you only shoot manual, what I'm about to tell you isn't gonna do you any good. If you shoot auto at all or exclusively, what I'm gonna show you next has got the potential to be very useful. So we, sh we saw in the first video, if we lift this up, it's a self timer, but we can also push and hold this down like that, okay? If you, if you do that, this will remember your exposure settings. So let's say that you're, you line up your, your image like this and you have something very dark or very light in the center and you're like, uh, I don't know, it's gonna throw off my images. So you look over to the side or the ground and you point your camera at it and you have much different meter readings. Just pointing to the center, you might see one one thousandth at f5.6 pointing to the ground you might see one sixtieth at f5.6 for two examples right what but you know that if you just point it at the center then you're not going to have a good exposure because what you're taking a photo of is over in the shade so perfect example of that you have a person standing over here in the shade okay and underneath a tree an awning next to a building whatever and over here you have an open field a snowy field a beach something that's very very bright it's two-thirds of your image. It's really going to throw off your meter. This is a little tiny dark patch, okay? So what you can do in this setting is you take a meter reading off this dark patch. You physically point your camera at it, or you walk up to your subject and you stand a couple feet away from them, and you point your camera at them. You get your exposure settings, and you hold this button down. If you release it, you're going to erase those settings. You hold that button down. You go back to where you were. You recompose your photo, and then you take your picture, and your camera will remember the exposure settings you had when you were pointing it at your subject and started holding down this button, okay? That's what this is for. This is for air settings like that where the light in the field that you're about, or the scene that you're about to take pictures of is going to throw off your camera settings and you want to override that for a specific type of photo. That's how you do it. That's what that's for. So single use situation, but also very useful in those settings. Last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about all of the steps needed to go through and take photos with this camera, okay? So first thing we're gonna do, auto mode, super easy. Make sure your film is loaded, you have good batteries, you've dialed in the correct uh, ISO back here. Now you're going to adjust the aperture until you get a meter reading that's in line with what you want. You have a shutter speed that's fast enough, you can handhold the camera if, you need, if you're doing that. And then after you have that, you're going to dial in your focus. Okay, that's, that's good, that's what I wanna have be in focus. And you take your photo, just like that, super simple. If you're in manual mode, what you're gonna do is you're going to adjust your shutter speed and aperture as needed to get your viewfinder to display a single light in the, uh, in, the L in the LED light meter. Okay, great, we've got that dialed in. Get our focus, take our photo, just like that. It's that simple. That's the process of taking a photo. Okay, what about double exposures? Well, double exposures can be done and they're pretty easy and I'm gonna show you how to do them in both automatic and manual mode. So I'm gonna start with manual mode simply because it's simpler and then we'll go back to automatic. There's a mechanical process to the double exposure and a scientific process. We're gonna start with the mechanical because it's important to know and uh, yeah, it's easier to learn. So what you're gonna do is take any slack out of the film. I don't have film in here right now, but you're gonna take slack out until you get a bit of resistance. Don't 
crank this, don't jam it, you'll damage something. Just take the slack out and, and that's what you want. You're going to look for your through your light meter and let's say you 1 1 25th of a second and 5 6 uh, f5 6 is the proper exposure okay we'll talk about the science of how to adjust this in a second but let's say you've you're, you've done all your adjustment you took you took your first photo here for your double exposure you're going to hold this film rewind knob like this you're going to put your finger on the film rewind button on the bottom and hold it and then you're going to advance the film like that. What that does is this button disengages the internal gearing. If that gearing is not disengaged and you hold this, something's going to get damaged. And you hold this to make sure that the film doesn't move. Now we're done. Take a photo again. That's our second photo of our double exposure. Advance the film and move on, right? Not quite. One other, other step we got to do. Set this to your smallest aperture. Set the camera to 1 1,000th. Grab your lens cap. Put it on and take a dead frame. Now you advance the film and you're ready to start taking your next photos. But wait, why is that? When you do the, the multiple exposure mechanics of holding down the film, rewind, release button and all that, you disengage the gearing inside of here. So after your second photo, you start advancing the film, but the film doesn't move immediately. So it's only going to move a partial frame and then your next photo, if you take it like that, will partly overlap your double exposure and it could ruin it's going to probably ruin your double exposure that you put a lot of time and effort into so you take the dead frame so that you completely advance your film and then you don't have any risk of an overlap with your double exposure and your next frame so that's the mechanical process let's talk about the science of it so you're going to take a single exposure and you're in manual mode and your light meter tells you that at 1 1 25th of a second f5 6 is the proper aperture. Okay. Film is designed to receive a certain amount of light, a certain number of photons, you can think of it that way, for a proper exposure. So if you take a proper exposure and then you do that mechanical process and you take another proper exposure, your negatives are going to receive twice as much light as they should and they're going to come out being what's called thick, dense, or dark. And that's three words that mean the exact same thing. The film received too much light. In traditional pro film processing in a dark room, you're going to have very long print times and very low contrast. With digitization, with a scanner or a digital camera, you're going to have very long digitization times and very high digital noise. And in both situations, you're going to have very low contrast in your images. In the dark room, you've got to throw on a contrast enhancing filter for that it makes the print times even longer. So at any rate, you don't want to put too much light onto your film. So the way to control that is with either your shutter speed or your aperture. So the camera's gonna tell you this is proper, but you know you need to have as much light. With your shutter speed, there are two ways, there's one way you can do that up here. These are fractions, so you have got to adjust your shutter speed to be half as much time, which is 1 2 50th of a second. Take your first photo, do the, the holding, advance, while you advance, take your second photo, and that's your double exposure. Okay, but let's say let's say you're at 1 60th of a second and you, you need to use a flash for both of these. So you cannot adjust the, the um, shutter speed. Let's say 1 60th and f5.6 is a proper exposure with your flash, but you, can't, you cannot change this. You're gonna have to do it with your aperture. To get to a half as much light on your aperture from f5.6, you're gonna go to f8. One stop smaller, five, six to eight is half as much light reaching your film through the lens, okay? So you can do that either way. If you're capped by your shutter speed or you're capped because you're at one one thousandth of a second, just make your aperture one opening smaller for each of your two photos and that's how you're going to compensate. If you're doing one indoor and one outdoor, same process exists just for different combinations of shutter speed and aperture. So that's the, the science behind it. You need half as much light for each frame. Okay, but manual mode can be really confusing and it's just easier, things are easier in automatic mode. How am I gonna do this? Actually super simple in automatic mode. What you're gonna do is let's say that we have 400 ISO film loaded in here. 400 ISO film needs a certain amount of light. If we switch this to 800 ISO, that's one stop faster, needs half as much light. So what you can do in automatic mode is simply adjust your ISO dial to the next film speed higher than what you have. 400 goes to 800, 50 goes to 100, right? 
800 goes to 1600. And then each of your two photos are shot in automatic mode at this faster speed. After you do your whole process, then make sure you remember to turn it back to the proper film speed for your non-double exposure photos. And that's how you do a double exposure in automatic mode. Super simple. So with that, that is everything we had to talk about with the Minolta X370. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in another video. Hey everyone, if that video was helpful, check out this other video that might be helpful too.